Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our first live discussion of the year on the art of book cover designs. Today we've got special guest Anne Pettigrew, Pat Rohurst and Leela Soma joining us to talk about their various experiences and share their insights on what makes for a great book cover design. We're first going to start with Anne who will speak to us about the extraordinary histories and also some of the trends she foresees for the next decade. Over to you, Anne. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Uh, except the host has disabled me. Can you allow me to share my screen, please? Yep. Candice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to consider book covers and I'd like to take a few minutes to go back to the basics. And when I was asked to do this, I wondered, why do we bother with graphic book covers at all? Both authors and readers though do need them. I'm concentrating mainly on fiction, by the way. So a reader might like to find a book cover that attracts them in some way to be something that they enjoy. So it might be beautiful or intriguing or striking or even scary. But I agree with Margaret Atwood, who says that they should be ethical. So in other words, if it's got aliens and spacemen in the cover, it should be about aliens and spacemen. <clears throat> and then we won't have the problem that we had so often, and I've even had it, not to judge a book by its cover, which was actually said by Mary Ann Evans, otherwise known as George Eliot, um, last century uh, or two centuries ago almost, not the American Edwin. Mm -hmm. So why do we buy a book? Um, there's loads of stuff online, lots of research, and I looked and it, it seems to depend on what country you're in, what age, what gender you are and your education. The written word is a marketing tool for um, authors who self-publish, and they reckon most people get their books from Amazon and Goodreads information. Most of my friends don't use Goodreads, and I must say I'm not terribly sure how to use it myself. Um, but it doesn't mention here my favourite ways of buying books, which is browsing in a bookshop, which we can't do just yeah. now or, um, you know, reading reviews perhaps in uh, proper press, as I call it, uh, the, in the written words on a, a newspaper or, or a magazine. Um, so uh, I'd like to point out here that the most important thing in buying a book is still the book description and the blurb. So it can be the best cover in the world, but if someone reads the blurb and doesn't fancy it, they'll not buy it. Uh, and I do agree with this chap, who was one of the earliest novelists who said, that nowadays even marvellous looking books can have awful content, and I've got a few recently. So looking back in the beginning was the word, as they say, and the original, the oldest story ever told is this epic of Gilgamesh here, which was poked into um, ceramic uh, clay tablets with a stylus in a cuneiform uh, alphabet and formed this epic, which is actually a lot of the stories in it are the basis of the Bible, the basis of uh, Homer's Iliad and uh, the uh, tales of the Arabian Nights. And it's also actually central, parts of it are central to my third work in progress, which is a prime book set in Oxford. The Egyptians used different things. They preferred papyrus, leather and bark. And apart from the fact that most of their original writing was religious or about politics and commerce. People did start writing stories and Ptolemy in 300 BCE started the first library at Alexandria and wanted to have a copy of everything that had ever been written. And the alphabets were either the hieroglyphics like the Egyptian, the little sort of trumpets and different angles of cuneiform or the start of alphabets which ranged widely across the world. The Greeks and the Romans, they tended to use the same things as, write down the same things as the Romans did, but they went more into narrative about voyages and victory. And the first scroll shop, you couldn't really call it a bookshop, was in Athens in 120 BC. But round about that time, mm -hmm. someone called Philaticus, which is a presumed where we get philately, the stamp from, invented binding glue, and you could start buying actual books. Um, mm -hmm. And the um, the books were just kept in tin trunks, they didn't, they didn't have covers. Until the Middle Ages, most books were precious, sacred texts and really were found in um, abbeys and in uh, fancy big houses. And the covers would be marble or ivory 
or silk or gold or silver, really very, very fancy. Getting into the Middle Ages, it was more about preserving the parchment and vellum, usually between wood and often between uh, brass locks and keys and straps. In 1450, along came Caxton, and that revolutionised things because you didn't have to wait for somebody to write the whole book out by hand. Uh, you could actually just keep printing a page that uh, you had set in typeset. And they said that in uh, 100 years, that Europe went up to 200 million books. Um, although it doesn't account for the number of times that people kept burning books for various political purposes. But most books were still quite exotic, like this beautiful Laura Sixivai from 1632, embre embellished and embroidered with gems. The bulk of the population, of course, were illiterate and couldn't even read hymn books. The 16th and 17th century, people used to make books to order and hand-told leather, for example, was uh, most likely. They started having their titles on the spine and they may have embellished uh, pictures on the front, sometimes in the back. The first big thing that made a difference was the machine press, which could churn out printed sheets much quicker. That came around in 1820 and around the same time Japanese woodcut techniques came in. Um, and books started being made with card covers covered in cloth and embellished and embossed like this lovely practical taxidermy, which would be very useful if you had a lion to stuff. But the uh, first book that really got into the hands of the ordinary people was at the end of the 18th, uh, end of the 17th, 18th century, people used to give out pamphlets about the crimes committed by people who were being hanged. Um, and this merged into, with cheap paper, into the first cheap books that were called Penny Dreadfuls. And the Victorians really took these to their heart. They were mostly Gothic crime and serials. And they were W.H. Smith books shops opened up in railway stations and they did really, really well. There then came Yellowback, slightly more upmarket, and they were often pirates, ghosts and knights. They had hand uh, art in them and woodcut prints. And you'll perhaps notice the title of this one. This is by Benjamin Disraeli, who was one of our prime ministers. And um, big authors didn't uh, disdain them. They were out to make money. And Thackeray and Dixon, mm -hmm. uh, um, Dickens produced some of these. They were often quite sensational, though, in the adverts in the back. And it was the start of the printer Routledge, who's still going um, way back in the, the mid 1800s. Self help books became very popular as the Victorian era went on. And they are the biggest selling book genre today. Uh, and many of these self-help books on the back page had adverts like this has for magazines and handbooks. Um, and the, um, this is Manly Exercises. I just feel like I thought that was quite funny. But to my mind, the artistic covers really started in Art Nouveau times from the 1890s onwards. Um, Bart will know more about this because I'm a, a very lay interested person in art. But the Yellow Book by Oshley Beardsley was a magazine about poetry and art. And it was recognised really as being starting the decorative trend that continued to its zenith in Edwardian times. And uh, I love, for example, this gilded uh, work of Life of William Blake that I inherited. Um, the influences were Bloomsbury Group and everything was very sinuous and sybaritic. The cloth and card here, um, there will be a pattern even on the spine, different pictures in the front and the back. And again, it's cloth and card and a lot gilding. But very cheap books continued, crime and comic novels especially. This is A Murder in the Library from the 1920s, um, an Agatha Christie that sold for only five pesetas in Spain. But the big boom in popular commercial books was Sir Alan Lane at Bodley Head, who decided that we could have a simple design, a book to book in your pocket, and it, you could buy it for sixpence in Woolworths. And so they had simple covers, you knew what it was, uh, it was going to be cheap and it had the title and the author and uh, mm -hmm. as you can see from these two books which are actually chronologically the wrong way around that the first one is older than the second mm -hmm. one but there's not much difference apart from the shape of the penguin. I've used Agatha Christie through time uh, to gallop through the trends in art and this is a 1924 Poirot book which as you see has got a proper um, drawing of Poirot on it and a little one on the side and it's even got its price on it which I don't think you would have um, nowadays because they're sold at so many different prices and then as we move forward into the 30s instead of it being a representational illustration 
here we have more cartoon silhouettes. I actually think this is quite almost pre-Nazi and, and ominous um, in the build up to the Second World War. But here's one which is not uh, another Agatha Death in the Nile with beautifully drawn scenes of Egypt and lots of little symbols on it. And for the first time here, there's reviews in the back and you're starting to get blurbs on the back of the books, which um, we'd never had before. This is some of my collection, which I've inherited over the years from Gary's relatives, some are mine, and it illustrates in the 60s and 70s how Pan and Fontana, who both brought out the same titles at different points and in different places, used completely different methods to market the same books. For Pan, it was the cosy, well, perhaps the pills are ominous, for the ballet shoe. And for Fontana, there's this great um, artist called Tom Adams. He wanted skulls and everything, even in golf balls. Um, publishers' branding becomes more obvious. You can see the little symbols. Wraparound covers could be a whole picture on the front and back. And the covers could change. If uh, Fontana wasn't selling much of a, a copy of a certain book, they would change the cover every six months. But this is a, a very late version uh, of an Agatha Christie from 2010 that I like, which shows you the modern trend. It's much more simple and enigmatic and stylish. So to run through trends over the 20th century from the historical <laughs> point of view, there were different every decade. During the First World War, it was quite kind of propaganda-ish, Cubism, Russian, Luchenko, um, lots of comics and magazines came in. The Bloomsbury group merged into Art Deco in the 30s. There were very decorative covers on the whole. And in World War II, very muted colours. Obviously, there was um, shortages during the war, but mostly they had people on them. In the 1950s, handcrafted illustrations and lots of scenes. In the 60s, text. And in the 70s, we get much more vibrant graphics and psychedelia. In the 80s, new techniques and special effects allowed lots of different things to be done in books, and Photoshop revolutionised a lot of um, graphic work. In the 90s, Boulder Text was the thing. There are loads of, you can spend loads of hours online looking at iconic book uh, lists of the, the most popular or iconic of all time. These two come up into every list, and I think they are excellent um, examples of um, just telling you what's in the book, though maybe it's only when you've read the book that you really understand what they are, uh, but they are everywhere. Now, I was charged by my um, publisher for helping to design the, the uh, cover for my second book, and I discovered very much that elephants that repel one reader can attract another. Uh, the first, this first version I actually quite liked, but I sent it to various focus groups, which included a few people who are here tonight in some of my writing groups and um, in friends and email. And a lot of them thought this looked more like a textbook, that it was too scary and it didn't go with the, the book. Uh, and that the one on the right was much more in keeping. The story is a crime novel, which is about a female doctor who is putting herself and her family in danger, trying to stop a male doctor killing people, but nobody believes her. Uh, and I thought this was kind of quite good, but I eventually got various versions of it. And the interesting thing is this is what we turned up with from the lovely John Harkins of Scottish Media. Um, there were a number of um, changes made to it at the last minute, which included the fact that the, the, some people thought the hand looked like a musician. So there was a, a, a curling rubber glove made more obvious. Um, and uh, it, it is in keeping with the other book, there's no doubt that branding and keeping a, a kind of um, trend going between your, your a series of novels is important. Um, the one on the right is set in the 60s, hence the kind of psychedelic, wavy uh, Beatles or Rolling Stones record cover font. Uh, and again, it was a battle between man and woman. But I felt that when I started photographing the second one for um, using on social media, I realised that its matte cover and greater prominence of its writing on a darker background made it easier to reproduce. So there's a lot of things, not just the colour, what the colour of the mood and the emotion is, what the font says, what the images say, it's not an easy thing to do. So looking online between various um, websites internationally about the trends in the US and Europe in the last decade and on into us was that it, one of the things that struck me, I had to look this up, college of found materials, people were putting a lot of little snippets of things like um, uh, 
newspaper cuttings or bits of a TV screen or something in it. So making a collage like you did as a, as a kid in, the, in art. Cartoon graphics became more important. And the problem in the US embossing and foil is a big thing, although I do have some lovely books here that have got that. Um, handwritten font is very much uh, to the fore. Single objects, um, angled texts, and messy covers. I've certainly seen a few of those. The millennial pink came up in several sites. And I have to say, I have yet to see a book that's millennial pink, but I dare say someone will change the, my idea of that. This is actually my favourite cover of the last 10 years or so for the goldfish. I think it tells me that this is probably um, a, a book with a, a literary book, maybe a light touch, it's maybe a personal story. I'm intrigued about what the, the, the goldfish is about. And of course, we'd have to read the blurb, which I think is part of the, the, uh, the delight of book covers. So that's just a run through from when you had a ceramic thing and a pole that you twirled through to books that, that cost six pence in Woolworths. And now you can get, I've seen hardbacks recently in the Sunday Times supplement where the initial hardback book is something like 50 on pounds. So um, that is all I have to say about the history of books. There's lots more if anyone's interested. Although the couple of people here from my book club have heard the long version of this, so they know all about it. But Thanks, thank you, Candice. Thank you, no, thank you for your amazing insights. Um, we now move over to Bart, who will be talking to us about the various elements uh, of what a graphic designer needs to consider when he starts designing his first book cover. Uh, over to you, Bart. Thank you, Candice. I will uh, share my screen. Let's see. Does everybody see this? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, well, now let's enlarge it. Okay, uh, well, thank you for, uh, for inviting me to this uh, evening. Thanks to Candice and Anne, and Anne for the beautiful presentation and the history and the beautiful examples of uh, Clockwork Orange and the Godfather and the beautiful Penguin uh, series. Um, I'm going to tell something about our studio. It's called a uh, uh, Rauers and Van Roon. It's a really Dutch, uh, <laughs> Dutch name. Um, it's me and uh, Ron Van Roon. Ron Van Roon is the one on the left. We share a studio. Uh, I, I started as an intern uh, many years ago and now we have the... Uh, uh, so he's my sort of a grandmaster who learned, uh, who learned a lot uh, to me. Um, and I'm going to present some uh, some of our five rules, of course, uh, with a little uh, wink. It's but it's it's the way we look at designing books. Uh, thou shalt uh, collaborate. Um, that's of course. It's always designing a book is always a collaboration between a publisher and a writer and author and designing, and eh, that's really important. That this come together in a good way. Eh? So that we get the freedom to do what we want and uh, well so I'm just going to show you some examples like this series uh, made a long time ago but it still looks a sort of a pop art uh, series for Ronald Gippard uh, he was a young angry uh, writer in Holland uh, we did, did this uh, series of designs sort of an anti, anti I still have the first one I you only have the I still have the first slide. Yeah, is it uh, with the rest uh, as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I was always on the almost at the end. <laughs> oh no, you don't see anything moving uh, now. No, no, we no. only have the art of book design. We don't have a slideshow. Oh, bring. Oh, yeah. It says it's resume share. Wait a minute. You're able to share the presentation, Bart. So. Um... If you click start, it might work. Yeah. You are... Ah, there can see. Oh, yeah. we are. oh, we missed that beautiful picture. Yeah, you see me and Ron Verona now? Okay. Okay, yes. well. Okay, but now... Yeah. Okay, you didn't see this uh, either? Uh, okay. No, well, no. Rule, I've seen the first one. Rule number one, thou shalt collaborate, and now you see the artwork, or not? 
Yes. 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 Okay. okay. Well, this is the 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 the, the, the poppy thing we did for for the young angry writer Ronald Gippard. It was all his six novels in a new uh, design as a series, so eh, to pull back attention to the public. Uh, still like these, uh, yeah, sort of an anti-design because it was really non-traditional, but suits very well for the author, uh, I think. Um, this is an illustration I made. These aren't book covers, but these are television guides. We also work, well, we do lots of stuff, but most uh, book covers, but VPRO is a, a broadcasting network and they have uh, art, uh, high standards of art, so they always call an illustrator or an artist to make their front cover. Uh, and we did lots of, you see all uh, the, the verses, uh, there, there were uh, presidential elections between Obama and Romney. It's uh, verses, but it's also Verenigde Staten, that's the uh, United States uh, uh, in Dutch. So there's a sort of a double uh, thing. But we made a fictional book cover for these Peter Buwaldo's in the center. Uh, it was only for this television guide, but now five years later, the author asked us to, to make this design in a real book. So now this is going to uh, be published in, a, in about a couple of months. So that's how strange things uh, are sometimes. Uh, keep playing, stay hungry, stay foolish, uh, as uh, Steve Jobs said, uh, we really like to play with typesetting, typography, make, uh, make them on their own. This one is for Paul Auster, it's called Unsichtbar, it's invisible, and I uh, played with the title to make this uh, front cover and uh, put the author really big on the, on the cover. Uh, I did his design for many years when he was at this publisher, the Arbeiters Pers. So uh, this is also a book jacket for him. This is, of course, the famous picture from, uh, I think, Life or Life magazine from the 50s. And I st still remember this. Uh, I remember this iconic photo. And uh, that's also something you can use. You can always call uh, illustrators to work together or... or or uh, try to get the rights for this beautiful picture. And uh, yeah, it was allowed to use on the book cover. Uh, this is also another Paul Auster, it's more a non fictional, uh, sort of a diary kind of uh, book. So he speaks himself, and that's why the R is, eh, the words are, are, are flowing out of his mouth. Um, well, this also uh, playing with type, it's sort of a Lego, uh, Lego. is it, uh, uh, it's called FAST and it's about uh, juvenile detention, uh, it's a novel but it's about juvenile detention and I made, made, made this uh, cells and it, the title is on the rooftops, eh? you can, can read FAST, yeah, it's of course in Dutch so, but <laughs> uh, it means something like uh, stuck. Um, these are details for new Tommy Wieringa cover. It's it's uh, been published by the Bezige Bijt, uh, and uh, these are columns. You write for a a, a big uh, newspaper, and uh, yeah, well, this is sort of a uh, yeah. How do you say that? Uh, uh, well, he thinks about our time, and he writes that, and 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 thoughts coming and go, and I. I wanted to represent it like this, but it's, uh, it, it came out uh, uh, because I was sketching with a pen and paper and I, I stroke on the, on the ink and then, so uh, um, not on purpose, of, uh, I, I came up with this idea. Uh, Wij zijn licht. It's uh, a, a cover for Gerda Blaise. It's about a, yeah sort of a, a combination of people who lives, try to live from light lo and love and no food. <laughs> so it, it, it obviously will go wrong, somebody dies, of course, and all these elements at the end of the tunnel and the light, I wanted to put it in the center of the book. 
Uh, well, thou shalt stand out. So the two second rule, it's, it's, uh, we always, uh, trying to teach that our interns or, or uh, people like you have two seconds to stand out in a bookstore. Yeah? So if, if somebody passes the books, they, you, you, you must be noticeable. Uh, we did all the book covers for Arnon Grunberg. It's a famous Dutch uh, writer. I don't know if you know uh, Arnon Grunberg. Uh, it's one of the yeah, big Dutch authors. And we made also kind of yeah, atypical designs, but really everybody knows these, these designs belong to Arnon Grunberg yeah, because of their, their really own atmosphere. Uh, well, something to stand out as well. You see, this is a, a poetry from Ingrid Jonker from South Africa. Uh, and we made this really colorful, uh, uh, it's also called uh, in, the, in the title, there's the word repetition as well, herhaalje. It's well, so that's also a way to stand out. Uh, always be aware what you're making. That's all also important because these are uh, young adult series. So these are for for uh, middle, yeah, well, kids from 12 till uh, 18 or something. And the stories are about them, and and that's a, this is a series we made for for the young adults, and it has a slash in in the middle because it was a collaboration with a real author and the story of a. One of these kids. Uh, well, uh, if we like, we, we may make illustrations ourselves, like this one. Uh, number four. Uh, well, thou shalt be simple. Less can be more. It's of course not not always that less is more because this beautiful art uh, nouveau covers were. Anne was told, uh, telling about this, of course can also work, eh? but, but we like it to keep things really simple. For instance, this book cover, it, it, it was two, yeah, you could uh, put it on two ways. So you see the front and the back. And well, there are only uh, three letters on it and two pictograms, but every Dutch person can read what it says. I don't know uh, if you know the word zoekt, but it's... Uh, yeah. eh? It's men, men search, it's like a, an, an ad when men is searching for a woman or in the eh, to get a relationship and women seeks for men. But every, every Dutch person uh, immediately sees what it, what, a, uh, eh, what the title is without uh, showing the title. So that's a, a fun way to play with. Um, this is a design for uh, Neskio. It's a uh, it's a book I think from uh, the beginning of the uh, past century, from nineteen twenties or something. But still a classic in the Dutch literature. And uh, well, in two thousand eighteen, we made this uh, very simple cover. It's only uh, the title or the writer, and and yeah, it looks like. I think uh, the screen has frozen. I think Bart has frozen. Yeah, I think Bart's screen has frozen. Bert? Bart? Something technical, I think. Yeah, I think it's um, probably the Wi Fi connection. They're stunning covers. Stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning and so wow. innovative. Yeah, what a what a showcase! Oh, so much thought had to go into a cover. It's quite amazing. Oh, it is. Yeah, as a reader, I, you really don't think so, right? I mean, you look at no. it. Well, you just think the cover has arrived. You don't realize what's gone behind it. Yeah. Share. Okay. Okay, everybody sees Miffy? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to hurry up a little bit. Uh, 
we like to, to, to keep the covers clean and simple as uh, if we can. Uh, this is an ode to the egg. It's a book about eggs, oh, every, every egg, hard boiled egg, uh, omelette. Uh, well, it's a nice book and we can play with the, uh, when you open it, really nice. Well, um, thou shalt have secrets. So we also like that, that, that there are, uh, there's something more in the, in the book when you have it in your hands and, and in second glance, you see things you didn't notice before maybe. This is about a wanderer who comes to a village and, and, and he's a, a stranger and, and he's also howling at the moon sometimes. So, so I try to combine a wolf Clever. And, and this wanderer in one picture. So eh, here's a, you, or you see a wanderer with a sort of a strange hat or, or you see the wolf. Um, the same uh, with this, eh? you don't see what it is, but if you look closely, close enough, you see a portrait of Jesus. Yeah. The Day I Met Jesus is a book about, uh, yeah, you know who? <laughs> uh, this is a really nice one, Rondit. Uh, it's called The, the Left-Handed, and we made the book so that you don't know where to open it. So <laughs> if I think, is it only for left-handed people to read this book or where do, where do you have to open it? The, the spine, uh, yeah, well, you can see the confusion. Uh, well, uh, and told uh, already about Art Nouveau, this book also uh, is situated in that period. And we made uh, this, this uh, em with embossed uh, gold foil, also beautiful cover. I think it's here in the back, so maybe you can see it shine. Yeah. Lovely. Yes, yeah, stunning. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. And we did it. We did uh, the inside as well. So to 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 have a relationship between the cover and and the inside, we also make the the, the title pages and uh, yeah, to continue that world uh, while reading. Uh, okay, so it's short to finish, uh, designing the Bible, uh, four years ago, uh, we were asked to design the Bible, um, and in, in Dutch it, or, uh, it's spelled like this, because uh, when I had to do it in English, I couldn't make the design I did for the Dutch market, because I was sketching like this, because uh, a lot of time you begin uh, search for nice uh, font, uh, for types, typesetting, and I suddenly saw something interesting happening here. And I thought, well, uh, hey, you have this really uh, strange letter combination in Dutch. It's, uh, it's called a Y. And uh, if you bring that closer together, you got a symbol in between. So I, I, shout, I shouted hallelujah when I, when I uh, saw this. And I was like, okay, now we're, now we're talking. We can... Uh, make something interesting. And uh, well, I got up with this design. This is the, the cover of the Bible. And I, uh, yeah, the title runs through the, uh, through the back. And yeah, here you see it from all sides. It's only the title and that's it. Really, uh, and well, and in the center of the book, of course, uh, the cross. It's also in black. Yeah, because of the first uh, Genesis with uh, the day and the night. Uh, well, and that's something, well, we like to surprise uh, people with. Well, this is the end. So uh, uh, thank you. You can look at our website and follow us at Instagram with our impossible name <laughs> for, uh, for the <laughs> English market. But, uh, well, thank you for now. Thank Thanks, Bart. That was yeah, fantastic, fantastic designs and lots of uh, geometrical elements in your choices. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, um, we can start with the Q and A, and I would like to start with um, our author as well, uh, Leela Soma, who's oh. here with us today. Hi, Leela. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Bart and Candice. Thanks for joining uh, us. Uh, yep. Lovely yep. presentations from both. Um, so, yeah, question, uh, Leela. As an author, how important do you feel a book cover design is for to lure the reader's eye, and can a book cover design also turn a reader away? That's a, a very interesting question. I think uh, it can work both ways. Um, I think it can lure people 
in as well as turn people away. Um, just looking at, you know, something, I was looking at the covers of books I have at home, you know, the old thing like uh, Shakespeare's volume, you know immediately, well, it's classic, it's something that you, you hold on to. Um, and, and then I was looking at the things I had from school, uh, my school days, I still have them that are, you know, book to treasure, to, to, to really kind of be, you know, happy about um, holding on to it, etc. Now, one of the things that really interested me was Monica Ali's book, which won the Booker years ago. And if you see the design, each of the letters has got a little bit of our Bangladeshi background, but the actual cover just looks like uh, any other fiction book. And I thought that's something quite interesting. And as Bart showed us, you know, there are so many different ways. There are two things that I think is very interesting. Um, I, I got this in America with uh, Amitabh Ghosh's Gun Island, which is all about climate change fiction. And I came to Britain and this is a completely different version of cover uh, for Britain. And I was going to ask Bart that, you know, whether it's going to be uh, different covers for different continents uh, for some reason. And I remember Anne Pettigrew saying, um, you know, about the pink millennials. I've got an old Jane Austen book, but here you are. They tried at one point to get the pink millennial and get the women to, to come and buy it. Now, I definitely think that relates to your question, Candice. Can you lure someone in a supermarket by having a pink uh, womanly cover and they can just grab it and put it into your supermarket trolley. Um, I think I think that, you know, that kind of proves it because these supermarkets are and publishers are commercially minded. And mm. I think definitely that's one thing to, to lure people. Um, can a book turn people away? I think so. I think, uh, you know, I, Personally, I wouldn't buy a book just by the cover anyway. You know, I would probably want to read, et cetera. But perhaps we can even have a vote amongst our audience here to see how many would actually be turned away from the uh, a book cover. So that'll be my my answer. I know you're running out of time, so I don't want to go yeah, on. I think we've got a slight extension. So I, if any of the audience would like to ask our panelists a question, you can unmute yourself and... Well, I've had several people asking me um, if Bart always reads the book before he designs the cover. Yes, uh -huh. that's a, that's a good Do question. you always read the book, Bart? Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, okay. No, but uh, that isn't even possible because uh, uh, in the most cases, the book is still being written while when we get started. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, not when, when with existing books who has to be translated, but... Um, most of the time, when uh, if, if it was your book is coming out, it, it's planned for next season, you know, and then we, we get started already, and the book isn't even published. And of course, you get some uh, the manuscript to read, and you, uh, yeah, you dig into it and you read uh, some parts of it, but you can't read the whole. Uh, the whole book. Yeah? So you did the interview with the publisher is really important because the publisher is between me and the author. Yeah? So the, the, the publisher knows uh, where the book's about and, the, and I interview with the publisher. I, we never have a straight relationship with the author. It's always the publisher who's our, uh, yeah, where we turn to if we have questions. So it's really important that you interview the publisher so you know what's the tone, what's the genre, what's what's it about, and you read some of the manuscript. So it isn't always necessary to read the whole book. And is it different in different countries? As they I, I think it may be per designer that there are, there are designers who per se want to read the whole, uh, the whole book uh, before they get started. So maybe, yeah. Uh, and the, yeah. no, the cover, Leela was asking about the cover, different covers for different countries. Oh yeah, most of the time, every every cover uh, yeah, uh, is for the, the specific country. So uh, our designs are most, most of the time are, are for the Dutch market. 
And if Arnhem Grunberg, the one, the, the, the famous writer, got uh, in England, he get his own cover in England. So yeah. they don't yeah. buy our design. <laughs> but, uh, we want to, of course, but I don't know why. I don't know why, because uh, huh? I think you can also uh, get the original cover in uh, to translate in. Uh... And can I refer back to Bart? One of the things he said is two seconds to get the attention of the reader and I think that's extremely important and also for the booksellers to know where to place the books and I found that was a problem when my book uh, came out. It is a crime, it's a murder book but it's not black, it's not blood coming out from everywhere and I think that, that'll be you know it was my choice because I wanted to show that it's not just blood and gore it is about you know an Asian life and in, in Glasgow and uh, um, I'm sure the booksellers are going to say, now, where do I put it? You know, it's got murder, yeah. but it is looking like a, a happy book. So um, mm. it might be a problem, but I think the writer can decide with the publishers what they would like to, you know. Um, so that was just an extra point about books and placing them on a bookshelf in a, a, in a shop, bookshop as such. Thanks, Leela. And a question for you. Um, how, diff how different was it when you chose the book covers for your two different books? And did you have to make a huge uh, change in the colors and the covers when designing the sequel? Uh, well, the first one I didn't have much to do with, really, uh, although I quite liked the final design. Um, and the second one, um, for various reasons, I ended up working with a, an artist and I found it great fun. And he actually didn't want to do it without reading the book. The book was finished for them. So, um, but other things I hadn't thought of, as he said to me, was that you have to make sure the cover can be seen in small pictures, not just in a big book cover. But if you see it on Amazon as a thumbnail, or, uh, you know, if you're going to put it in social media in small print. So uh, this is why I'm so delighted looking at Bart's designs because a lot of them are so simple. So when they're thought, you're not trying to work out what's in the background. Um, so I thought that was um, quite uh, important. Uh, and I thought that the, the second book was much more crime. The first book was more about sort of sexual harassment. The first one's really about medicine and the effect of being a medical person and being naughty with sex. And the second one was about murder. So um, I don't know whether that makes one gray and one black. Yeah. Uh, but um, we approached them as if they were different books, yeah. but they had to have elements to link them, basically. All right. Thanks, Anne. Is there anyone else who has a question for our panellists? Um, I'm just start a, ask a question for Bart, really. What's your favourite font? <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a nerd. <laughs> I love fonts. <laughs> Ooh. That's a difficult one because there are, of course, many, many millions, of them. Millions, millions. Millions, millions. Uh, but if I have to mention one, uh, it would be the Futura. Uh, How do you spell that? I've got to write that down. <laughs> Futura. F U T U. F U T U. Yes. You are a, I think uh, even Anne uh, used it in her presentation as well. But I don't know. I, know I, I love fonts. I'm yeah. not always good I, at them, but I love fonts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you do, but it's a timeless uh, design, but it's designed in, I think, 1930 or something, and it's still, uh, yeah, modern till this day. There, there's a nice the... book. Hey, there's, Ron. There's <laughs> a nice book about the Futura. The, the book cover says, never use the Futura unless, and then they all name uh, famous logos like Nike, um, there are so many famous logos with the Futura. Even mm. the Germans in the Second World War were using it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, not, it's a really timeless type. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. 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 That's brilliant. Thank you. That's, that's Ron van Roon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Ron. Hi, Ron. He was, was also joining us. I didn't see you yet, but uh, great to have you here. I went to the barber today because then <laughs> <laughs> don't boss we can't go to barbers we have no hairdressers i can't find myself here today 
Look what she's really done tonight. Thank you both so much, <laughs> Bart and Anne. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. And uh, before we end, I would like to also introduce uh, the founder of Literary Globe, Lisa Luzia, with us today. Uh, we are a startup based in Amsterdam and uh, a digital platform that brings together readers, writers, bookstores, and all literary services. Our mission is to get the readers back into the bookstores. So um, thank you so much for joining us all today. Thank you, Bart, mm -hmm. Lila, and for making the time, the fantastic presentations, and for all yeah. our participants for making the time on a Friday evening. We hope to see you for the next one as well. Have a lovely weekend. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so thank you much. Bye. 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 Bye.